The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Father Michael Gosset. Welcome back, Father. Dom, it's really good to be back. It's been a while. <laughs> As we were just saying before we started, uh, we haven't had you on in uh, since, since June, so it's great to have you here. I hope you're having a great summer. And uh, Thomas Sanjero. Hi, Thomas. Hey, Dom. It's good to be back. Yes, it is. It's excellent to be together and uh, and being talking about tech again. It's it's the doldrums of summer. So people sometimes say, "Oh, <laughs> there's no tech news." There is tech news. Let me tell you, folks. Oh man! There's but today we're having <laughs> we're having a little bit of fun. Uh, there's a lot of negative tech news, unfortunately, <laughs> and we've we've been immersed in that for long enough. And we've been having some fun the last few weeks talking about some uh, more some some stuff that's a little closer to home, less about the big scary stuff and and hopefully more about the, the day-to-day tech use, hopefully. Although our first topic today, we'll get right into this, is about a big topic, but if sort of a fun big topic, I think. Um, and far away. And far mm-hmm. away, exactly. <laughs> you know, this summer we've been commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, the Apollo 11, and so we've had space on our minds. Uh, just a couple weeks ago we had a great episode, I think it was last week, a great episode of Let's Talk, one of our other podcasts on the SQPN network. Uh, which we talked about the history of spaceflight with Australian spaceflight historian Scott Pook. It was awesome. I wasn't on that episode. I was listening to it, and just it was a blast. I mean, because he's Australian, so there's that, which is just always a, a bonus. And then he's just he's so knowledgeable about uh, spaceflight and everything like that. So uh, such a great a great episode. And I and, and I love space. We've talked about space before on this. We I think we're all space geeks, and yeah. <laughs> uh, so. But there was an article recently at Gizmodo uh, that the the headline is, of course, designed to cause controversy and get people riled up. And the headline is why humans will never or it just says humans will never colonize Mars. And that's like, boom, shot across the bow to every every space geek out there, because we're all like, no, no, this is the thing. Like, we're all, you know, uh, we need to pre- uh, colonize Mars. That's the next big step. So. The premise is that there are several obstacles, and we could get into them as we, you know, as we talk about a little bit. But the the big thing that they say, one of the big things, is radiation. Even though we know we can bury our, you know, our space habitations, uh, you know, on the other planet, it'll take time. Um, and and if, you know, eventually we could maybe mine underground and get protection that way, but. The fact is, in the short term, there will be unacceptable levels of radiation exposure, huge cancer rates, and all kinds of stuff like that for colony. This isn't just like visit, stay there for a few months and come home, but to have a permanent colony on Mars, a permanent, like Elon Musk, is, is uh, his goal is. So let's start with, let's start there. Do you agree with the premise of this, of this story at Gizmodo, the, this idea that, um, Humans will never colonize Mars. And then we can talk about the moral implications of should we colonize, given what we know might happen to people. So let's start with the agree with the premise first. Uh, Thomas, let's let's start with you. Um, yes, I do, actually. <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't agree with the way it's stated uh, because the the article goes through and provides a lot of technical limitations. It does get into a little bit of the moral question. But uh, the technical limitations is what it stays focused on. And that is never going to be our boundary in space um, because we're going to solve stuff. Uh, the boundary in space is always going to be the viability of it. So why are we going to colonize Mars? Uh, and that's that's kind of where I think the, the it's an interesting article because it talks about a lot of the challenges. But there's already proposals for uh, a magnetosphere like NASA already has an idea to make an entire magnetosphere for the planet. And that's part of what they would say needed to be done if we're going to start even uh, thinking about like terraforming Mars or just putting astronauts there for a long period of time. So the technical challenges, I don't think are a limitation, but I think like 
why, uh, you know, trying to justify it to people here is always going to be the really big trick with anything we do in space. Interesting. Let's, we'll get into that. I want to, I want to get into that then, but, uh, father, I want to get from you then. What do you think? Did, did you agree with the premise of the article that humans will never colonize Mars? I really don't want to, but I feel like <laughs> I sadly have to concede. Like, I, like, like Thomas said, the, the title, why humans will never colonize Mars. It, it throws out a ton of obstacles, and, and like those are really hard. But surely someone in the past said why humans will never land on the moon, and we did that. Uh, yep. And we haven't gone back, which really clearly shows how difficult all of this is. And I think when people look at space stuff and they see the flashiness of like SpaceX and just like, we're really doing it, we're moving forward. Well, it's, it's really hard, it's really complicated, and uh, I think it'll, it won't be as soon as we all hope. And like growing up and I mean, watching sci-fi movies. And I think there's an image from total recall in that article. Yep. And it's like, Oh, Mars. So cool. <laughs> we'll terraform it and it'll be great, but it's going to be a long time before anything real, uh, even on the moon, I think is gonna, it's just way harder than we, we assume it's just so many complicated pieces technologically. And that's not getting into as the article does what it does to our bodies to be in space. And I, we talked about it on other podcasts, The Expanse, and I just think about uh, that really does a good job of showing um, it changes humanity to live right. in space. And that's something we have no idea of on any large scale what it's like. He, people being on the space station is a really small number of people in the big, the big picture, and they're there for decent amounts of time, but not living there permanently. Elon Musk, like his drive is we need to be – we need to get enough people off this planet to avoid a, uh, a an extinction level event. Like, so if an extinction level event were to hit our planet, you know, an extinction level as in kills all the human beings, whether it's a, a man caused like a nuclear war or an asteroid or something. But if we can get people on another planet, humanity will continue. And I think that is an essentially either agnostic or even atheistic point of view it, it's based on the idea that because we are material because we're, we're not spiritual and because there isn't a god who loves us and protects us and and has a plan for us uh we have to protect ourselves from a cold cruel uncaring universe uh, whereas i think from a catholic point of view a christian point of view i would my my understanding and i'm not saying i don't think the church has ever definitively stated this is that until god says we're done <laughs> <laughs> until your know, creation is done and this is the second coming until he says that that you know th there's nothing that's going to wipe all humanity out and likewise when he says we're done it's like done. Dad, when dad says you're <laughs> that's done it, playing, that's it. It, yeah. it doesn't matter how many other planets you've colonized uh, yes. this time's up guys <laughs> right <laughs> so uh, so i i think the the viewpoint is essentially you know the the drive to do this part of for some people it's related to that um, yeah. But I think there are also some people who, from a Christian point of view, God's creation is amazing and wonderful. And I want to explore it. So there's there's still that there. So what that's, what do you think of that? Yeah, that, that's absolutely me. That's the um, I I I think we should step foot out into everything that that I mean we our our primary call of a uh, um, uh, Bishop Barron puts it this way when he's talking about Genesis. He says that um, Adam was the first scientist. That was God's job for Adam mm. was go name the animals. And um, it's, that's just a, it's a, it's a, an instruction to go look at the things in the world and figure out what they are. And there's only so much we can do by sending robots out to do this stuff for us. Uh, right. it's, it's such a limited uh, set of things that, that we can do. And, and there's so much ingenuity in a human being there and, and really seeing it with their own eyes and really putting their hands in the soil and discovering all the stuff that's there. Um, that we, we, we need to, we need to be a part of it. We need to be, we need to be a part of that exploration. And so that, that's my mentality to it. I, I really, there's no way, uh, we're going to get enough people living on another planet in, in any kind of feasible way that, that that's where we're going to actually live. If the earth fails, if the earth fails right. and somebody's living on Mars, they're going to fail too. <laughs> you know? be mm -hmm. Better to be here and go quickly than there and go slowly. Right. <laughs> so. the, the, right. As, as it stands and until the, into the distant imaginable future, 
a, a Mars colony is indelibly tied like an umbilical cord to the Earth. There just mm-hmm. is not enough of anything that we need on Mars, unless except for dirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> apart, apart from, I mean, frankly, the uh, the the movie and book, um, the Martian, the Martian yeah. showed how difficult it is for even someone who's well equipped and by himself to survive uh, mm-hmm. for any length of time. Just the idea of how to grow anything. Uh, it is it is harder than we can imagine. I, well, I mean, like, there are countless books written about that too. You know, I mean, all right. of the um, the Heinlein books were all about that kind of thing, and then the James A. Corey series, The Expanse, is a, a lot of the politics are about Mars not being able to survive really on its own. Right. So right, and all about the terraforming, which which drives so much of the culture and politics of the future it, it imagined in those books and TV series. Uh, so I'd like to talk about the morality of co- colonization, some of the issues that come up. Some of them came up in the article. There are other ones I've seen in other places that, that weren't, I don't think were mentioned in that article. Uh, I don't recall. But one of the first ones is this problem of radiation and cancer rates. And, and so the question, the first question is, would it be moral to send people to live on Mars long term? Again, not short term astronauts visit for six months and come back or even a year and come back. But you are there permanently to live, but some very large percentage of you we know will die from cancer, avoidable cancer. And so it's just a matter of attrition. We have to get more people there than, the, than die off from cancer. Do you think as a, as a society it would be moral to do that, even if people are going in knowing this is the case? What do you think? Ah, moral <laughs> questions. We're back in moral <laughs> m- morality back at seminary or in college, a uh, theology degree. It's oh. a tough one because, uh, I mean, we, a bunch of people came to this country not knowing what they were getting into, mm-hmm. and they dove into it, and lots of people died, and it took time, uh, and just that continual buildup of Europeans to, to have this civil- civilization here. Yeah. And so in that sense, uh, it takes that, but it also takes people willing to put themselves in harm's way. And I think that's the tricky thing with Mars. And I mean, it was a couple of years ago. It, was, it wasn't it was real, but people were signing up for a permanent, a one-way trip to Mars. And right. I remember just that. this idea is like, there are people that will say yes to that. I don't think it's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I, I'm one of them. If, if I didn't have a family here that I have already established and that I'm responsible for, I would absolutely go and live the rest of my days on another planet. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think twice about it. So. Uh, in, you know what? I, th- I think I, it was either a podcast or an article I read about a guy who, was, who volunteered for that, even though he does have a family and mm-hmm. was prepared to leave his wife and children behind to go. And what that meant and how he, he ended up not, of course, the whole thing fell apart. But what that did to him and his family, the, this idea, just the, the, the concept that they would leave them all behind. Um, yeah, I mean, that, so yeah, I think you're right, Father. Like There was this, it was similar to when they colonized the New World. It, for many people, it was a one-way trip. You, I'm going to go. I'm either going to make it or I'm going to die <laughs> trying. There's, I'm not, there's no way back. Um, and many people died until we eventually just got a critical mass of people uh, here in the new world who could survive. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I think I think there's something to that. As long as people are going in it with an open, under, full understanding of the dangers that they're 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 right. going to encounter, I think. Right. And I think you have you always have the explorers and the the, the Marie Curies who are, you know, knew full well what she was doing with radioactive material and still wore a right. piece right against her skin to see what the cancer would do to her. And that was like, you know, that was one of the things that she, she understood what the risks were. She understood what was happening, but she still was interested in advancing science in such a way that, um, that that was one of her experiments. And um, I think that's, that's, it's an incredible sense of, of humanity that says, my life is bigger than just this meaty stuff that I'm made of, you know? Right. I think even the, the first astronauts that they were, there was a question, can a human swallow in space? Right. Mm-hmm. And, and just that, that very small thing that it took that special kind of person, those, especially those test pilots that had been living like that, uh, trying things that were incredibly dangerous just to push forward. Um, we, we have those people in the world. And they kind of make these things happen. 
Uh, this would be a big, big step. But as Thomas volunteered, uh, <laughs> there are some there are some people that are interested. I I, I know it's a, a topic a little further down our list, but I like the idea of would priests volunteer to establish the church on Mars? Yeah, yeah. yes. Well, I do want to talk about that. That's mm -hmm. a that's a very interesting question. Uh, you know, speaking of like the, the would would astronauts they it was a question would they even would they can the human body survive in weightlessness because we'd never done it there was even going back even further in time there was a question whether the human body could survive going as much as fast as 50 miles an hour could mm -hmm. the human body survive uh and and you know it turns out yes but that wasn't a question and but someone had to be the first one to do it so uh, it, it's an interesting idea so one of the one of the problems is mars is very low gravity and very low atmospheric pressure. And even within whatever domed environment they would have, it would be lower pressure than here on Earth. And people could adapt to it. But but it's pretty much, I think it's acknowledged that people born there would not, probably not be able to come back to Earth. They would only, because of the, their body would not be able to withstand the higher gravity and the higher air pressures. So what do you think of the the, the implications for society culture for humanity as a whole to have a part of it permanently cut off from from the rest of it what do you what do you think of the morality of that or even just the theology of that uh what do you what do you think i think i think it's an interesting uh concept to go through and and um and figure out what that's going to mean for us because we have such a problem right now looking at a person that has a different skin tone from us and considering them human uh it just to think like what it would do to us that these people are actually physically they're Martian. altered. Yeah. They're, they're <laughs> Martians. And, and, that, and that's, and that's yeah. a reality. Like, you know, we're talking, we're talking, it, it could within a few generations of colonization like this, uh, it could become something very similar to the, the difference between a homo sapiens sapiens and a homo erectus. And right. uh, that it's an evolutionary track that these people are going to be taking. That's dramatically different from where we are. And um, we're not really sure what that's going to do. And, and we're not really sure. And like I said, you know, I mean, we have so many problems right now just dealing with uh, different different uh, races, as we call them here, where we're all the same. Uh, it'd be amazing to see what, what the difference in those would be. Because, I, I, you know, you look at some of the drawings of what this might do to the human body, and, and it ends up being this elongated, almost uh, like what the, the classic, alien the gray, yeah, the gray with the or, yeah. conical mm -hmm. head and the <laughs> super tall gangly arms uh so i don't know uh, it's it, it's an interesting question uh both physiologically but also psychologically for the whole of society and how we would deal with people like that even just like father? culturally yeah. the idea of what happens when you you split humanity up that much that you could communicate just like we do on the earth at some degree but uh you see how culture changes here uh, i just reread uh michael d o'brien's the voyage to alpha centauri mm. which is a fantastic book but uh just that this other planet of humans is going to look very different in not that long of a time when you're cut off that way right. yeah interesting now there are there are some moral implications to the process some some sort of practical moral implications especially related to uh birth pregnancy uh, and if folks, if you get kids, we're going to be talking about uh, adult stuff for the next couple minutes. So maybe pause and uh, listen or fast forward for for about uh, 10 minutes or so. But with, uh, we're not going to get explicit. But if you're uncomfortable with these topics around little kids, that's uh, just a fair warning. But for women, can, you know, there's a question right now. Can women give birth successfully in zero or low gravity? Just like the whole can can people swallow in weightlessness? Can women give birth or carry a, a baby to term? How do we test this morally? Do we mm -hmm. send pregnant women up in spaceships? And and given the G forces, that seems dangerous. You just mm -hmm. just getting them there. Do we let them go up and impregnate them in space? I mean, that's a, these are some interesting, you know, concerning moral questions. Um, and then even just things like on a long journey to Mars and back, which can take, some people have said, uh, 18 months, two years, especially given the amount of time they're there, men and women traveling together, presumably not necessarily married over the course of that, this period of time. 
what do we do about men and women being living in such close quarters? The space agencies will want to prevent conception. So there's there are moral questions here. What do you think of how we, you know how should we deal with this? Is is it women shouldn't go? Because <laughs> that's not going to fly these days. What do you think? It shows like how big of a leap that it is that we've never had to deal with this the issues on this level. And it also shows how just how slowly it's going to take that um, we have men and women living on the International Space Station. Um, right. And so we've taken that much of a step without like families and things like that being involved. And uh, honestly, like this is such a non answer, but who knows? We don't we don't know. And we don't know how to, to proceed in any sort of way, because I feel like we're not even we're not even within inches of of what of being able to do this of, right. of being practically doing that getting a couple people to mars and then coming back will be an incredible leap and so i think i mean as catholics we could say well, you're not gonna test things on pregnant women or get have women be get pregnant to see what happens that it's just inherently wrong uh, and so there, there are going to be complicated steps and questions down the line when we actually can get the capacity to do this Hopefully, we'll be at a place societally where our voices as Catholics, as moral voices, uh, will be heard. I don't think today is we're in a position where our voices would be heard. Uh, hopefully, when the time comes, we will have regained some of our moral voice in in society. What do you think, Thomas? Yeah, I, I, um, it's an interesting topic. It's a, uh, it's there's a lot of difficulties to it. I think that. Um... You know, anytime you're talking about a, a trip like this, you're looking at something that's completely foreign to us. But also, there's there's a lot of precedent for this historically because you had voyages uh, in the age of sail that would take months, and uh, you know you would leave out, and there would be months long periods where uh, people were together. But again, it was all male crews uh, for a majority of them. But there still is even in that there is precedent of of mixed crews, especially on pirate ships. Right. Um, and and we didn't ships, have, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't have, uh, you didn't have like a rampant problem with this kind of stuff because there was a camaraderie that was built between, uh, the crew that, no, we're a crew, we're a family. We, we work together. We, we do everything together and, and we take care of each other in, in the ways that we need to. So I, I think that's a lot of what you would end up finding in this situation. And I, I I really do believe that most of the people that they're going to send on the first mission are probably going to be married people because there is this kind of implication that being a married person, there's some intrinsic value to getting them back. They're not just like, you know, we're not sending them out there just as like this, this just to die. <laughs> person to float out there in, right. in space. Uh, and so I, I really do. I, I hope that that's a consideration that goes into it is like sending some people that are that are family people because of that. Uh, that connection back to home that they'll have as they go. And then it sends a message that, like you said, that we intend to bring them back to their families. Right. Uh, exactly. That's, that's a good point. Actually. And that would kind of not necessarily solve. It's not that married people never stray, but certainly if you're an astronaut and there's three, there's two of you in a space station and you're not married to each other. And when he gets pregnant, everyone kind of knows what happened. Oh, right. So, so there is a bit of pressure to not, you know, stray on that. So that would probably be uh, worthwhile to think about. Uh, but these are interesting moral questions that we will have to deal with or struggle with at some point down the line. Uh, and I just I find them fascinating to think about um, and to, to kind of consider, are they are they obstacles to to colonization and, and heading out there? Now, one thing, Father, you hinted at was one of my questions was, how would how do you think the church would deal with th this going outward into space to permanent settlements, whether they are um, more like military bases or government bases or colonies, if those could happen either on the on Mars or on the moon? Um, how would the church work with, deal with that? At what point, what size of an organization or you know a settlement? would we have to have before we started saying we need a chaplain there, for instance, what, what do you, and father, would you be uh, among those to volunteer? That's the, that's my uh, other question. <laughs> uh, so, so, so to me, it seems like a priest or an order of priests would be pretty solid uh, volunteers for something like that, yep. especially once the, 
when you think about the kind of culture that we'd be exporting uh, to another planet, that if it's as secular as as we're experiencing now, you're going to want to make sure that the faith the faith goes there, and that um, that it's not just I don't know I don't know what Elon Musk believes in his heart, but it's not just sort of a humanist utopia on another planet. But uh, and so I could see that the church would want to have somebody go go on even and i just think it's it's a sci-fi book series or movie series waiting to happen <laughs> of, uh, of that story of what it, the church took to uh to evangelize on another planet what the how like as catholics that connection to to rome what that would look like when mm-hmm. when you're on another planet i think is it I think it's with the moon that it belongs to the Diocese of Miami. Am I right? Because no. that's where the yeah. Orlando, actually, Orlando, right? Orlando. Right. Yeah. So it, the Th- so, Thomas's diocese, right? Uh, it's the one next door to me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah. So the Bishop of Orlando of Orlando is the bishop over Cape Canaveral, where the astronauts took off from. And so, according to the old Age of Exploration precedent of you know the 1400s, 1500s, uh, that meant that bishop is the one who is the first apostolic administrator for the new land so yep <laughs> so, which which means yeah. he'll also be mars because we're launching stuff from yeah. mars to the or from, from, the, moon from the moon to, to mars, mars. So. that's right <laughs> the, the real interesting thing will be when there's enough people the diocese <laughs> of whatever mount olympus that uh <laughs> that, that gets, gets established as, as its own thing that that will be an interesting era yeah i've 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 seen there are books that imagine like people go uh priests going out and evangelizing aliens and that sort of stuff. So that's a little bit further out. I'd love to see something a little closer to home, like Andy Weir's books, like The Martian and in, in his second book, Artemis, that, or, or The Expanse, something that was a little closer to, to our reality, a little more near future fiction that, um, that sort of imagines that, but for, from a, a priest or religious going out mm-hmm. and, and to, the Mar- to the moon and to Mars. That would be very interesting to me. I'd love to see that. Well, there's really good. There's really good uh, history of that too. With you have the 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 colonists coming to America as well. Really, the first explorers coming to America, and um, you know, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of uh, rewriting of history that goes on nowadays and says, well, they were horrible and they tried to convert all the all the natives and everything. But but really, if you look at the actual journals of these men that came across, they were there for the cruise. That was their purpose. The cruise then found natives. <clears throat> and the crews tried to use the church as sort of a hammer to right. to to knock these people into order and the priest kind of got caught up in it and that, that's where where a lot of that ended up happening and so the, the, but, but the priests were there primarily for the crews that they were with and i think you'd have something similar if you sent a catholic to space if you sent a catholic to mars um you're gone for a year and a half uh that's pretty much the the low end on the timeline that we're looking at and um that's a long time to be away from communion, to be away from uh, confession. You're, you're not meeting your obligations if you're in there. And so something would have to happen. Something would have right. to, to give in that situation. <clears throat> it would be very interesting. Uh, perhaps even um, enough hosts to last you for a year or so, some odd to, to get back. It Which they have done on the space station before. They yeah. have, yes. So, the Italian it's... astronauts took some hosts up with them. Some, uh, some Eucharist, I should, I should say, be more specific. Uh, so this is a great topic. I'd love to, I want to come back and talk more about space. Uh, I love talking about space. And so uh, we, we will talk about more, more about this on Secrets of Tech. If you have, uh, listeners, if you have anything you want to say on this topic, we'd love to hear from you and, and you know, to, to send us your feedback and your opinion on this. And this is all open speculation for us. And, or if you have any uh, informa- information that we don't have, we'd love to hear it. Uh, I'll give the allow all the contact information at the end, but you can email us at technology at sqpn.com and we'd love to hear from you. So we want to move on to our second segment tonight. We're talking about uh, we're moving ages and uh, across the expanses of the universe to <laughs> something a little mm-hmm. closer to home, but we're, but something that's universal, which is music. We all, I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who doesn't like music and maybe you're out there, maybe you're listening right now and you don't like music. But I think it's a pretty universal experience that people like music. And music is a huge part of technology, of, of all of our technology. Our phones are basically music players. It's how they started. The iPod was a, was, was, is really the genesis of the, of the iPhone and the, the smartphone. So 
we want to talk a little bit about how we listen to music, especially digital music, and some of our ideas, and tips, and things. And then we can sort of start a conversation with the audience about how you experience music in your favorite ways. But I figure we could start by talking about how we enjoy music and our background with music. Uh, and when I say that, I, I, like I'll start. Uh, I'm old enough to have owned al uh, vinyl albums, cassettes, CDs, eight tracks. I had an eight track player as a kid. Not many of them. In fact, I think I have a box of eight tracks in a closet here that my mom gave me. I think like the it's like one of them has the Beatles on it. Uh, it might actually be worth something. I don't know. Um, but I also started with MP3s very early. I, I actually won a Diamond Rio pl uh, MP3 player back in. Oh, I remember those. <laughs> 99 or something like that, like way <laughs> back. Um, you could put like 15 songs on a card. I mean, it was amazing. And uh, and I ha also had um, Sound Jam, the, the software on my Mac, which was the predecessor. Cassidy and Green Sound Jam was the predecessor to iTunes. It, Apple bought it and turned it into iTunes. So I've had basically had the same iTunes library for over 20 years, which explains a lot of why it works as poorly as it does. Oh, nice. <laughs> but uh, so so I just wanted to curious to you guys, start out to you, like your background in music, what what kind of music did you start with? And 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 in what your what was your first digital music player and that sort of thing? So, uh, Thomas, let's start with you. Um, I am I am not old enough to have really gotten into vinyl. That I I do remember having one of those small toy record players when I was really little. Um, and my dad wasn't. Uh, my dad was always into music, so he had a big turntable. Uh, but he very quickly moved on to the new uh, to whatever the new thing was. And so as soon as uh, cassette players came around, that's what he was on. And he uh, he got me very much into it, but I remember as a kid, uh, one of the first things I did with my allowance and it freaked my parents out because they were <laughs> like, what, who is this child that we have? Uh, first thing I did was I went to a, a music store and I bought a, a cassette of classical music. Uh, and that's just, <laughs> it just wasn't something that I had enough of in my life and I wanted more. And so I had no idea what I was buying. So I talked to the person behind the counter and they're like, oh, well, you should try this one. And so I bought a, a cassette of Beethoven uh, music. And I think it was like the Fifth Symphony or something like that. And, um, you know, that's one of the first things I spent money that I had myself on. So music's always been a really big part of my life. Um, and I've always kind of moved with the stuff. I resisted MP3s for the longest time because when they first came out, I was... Uh, a, a snob in late high school, early college, and didn't want the lower quality that was an MP3. <laughs> everything yep. that went along with that, but uh, part of the Napster scene during that as well. So once I finally got into it, I finally, you know, started uh, pirating music and everything with everyone else. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, I have a I have a healthy collection now. Um, although I'm moving away from having my own MP3s and uh, more into the streaming services too. Yes. I want to talk about that in a second uh, yeah. because that's a big deal. Uh, Father, how about you? Yeah, when I really got into music, it was uh, my parents, Led Zeppelin and the Beatles records. Mm. Uh, and I would use cassettes and tape tape songs, songs I like, tape songs off the radio. Um, even when I got CDs, I was taping, making mixtapes uh, <laughs> from the CDs. Yep. Um, but when it came, uh, I think my first CD that I bought myself was uh, – the Sign by Ace of Base, which is uh, some oh, strong, nice. strong 90s <laughs> jams. Um, yep. <laughs> I still but, have that uh, one. <laughs> it's a good song. Uh, when I think it was late high school, when I was like, you can download music. You can get it from like the ether of the internet. And uh, yeah, right in there with, uh, I don't, th I think I missed Napster, but uh, Audio Galaxy and uh, all that stuff. And I just like, but I didn't keep it on my computer. I was I thought, well, you don't keep digital music on your computer. You make it into a CD and you keep your CD forever. Um, and so <laughs> right. it, it really wasn't until uh, I think like later on, the end of college and into seminary that I I like ripped these 100 CDs or something onto my computer. And, and finally, everything was in an iTunes library uh, and got like a little I got an iPod shuffle. That was a big deal when I got that little square clip on thing and, and finally down the line. But uh, yeah, so it, that, it's been a journey of uh, more and more technology. Uh, until very recently, I had a large 
one of those big, you know, Rubbermaid storage bins in my shed with CDs and cases that I'd all ripped because, you know, you have to own your stuff. You know, I ripped it. Uh, But as soon as I moved to a subscription, I'm like, well, now I don't even need to keep this. Out it goes. (laughs) I I think I gave it away. Like I, I, I put it on the, you know, the local free to whoever wants it, uh, you know, Facebook page that we have in our, in our town, Uh, you know, and take what you want. If you like it, keep it, don't get rid of it, whatever. So how do you listen to music now? Uh, Do you buy it? Do you, uh, Thomas, I think you've kind of hinted at it. Do you, do you subscribe to a streaming service? Um, Do you prefer to buy music? Do you buy music and stream it? You know, do a little of both, but what do you do now? Thomas, I'll start with you. I, I am cheap. I am cheap, cheap, cheap. Um, so I have I, I have a Pandora account, and that's uh, that's really how I keep up with music too, because it, it's kind of a natural radio selection of uh, things that I like. And my kids have gotten into it too, so they they have things that they like, and they start up channels on there, and they use the channels to discover new stuff. Um, and I I rarely, rarely, rarely buy music but i do buy tracks that i really enjoy to be able to throw some money at the artists because uh you know i want to support them if i if i'm really loving something uh i I will definitely buy uh their music just to try and give them some support so uh is pandora still like you you can't choose the music you want you you pick a song to start and then it's plays similar music right yeah yeah and and uh it, it plays all what basically what it does is it, it has like tags that are placed on any kind of given kind of music and you you pick a song or an artist and then it makes a radio station based off of that song or artist and so it just grabs a whole bunch of other stuff that has similar tags and then you thumbs up or thumbs down and it can kind of narrow it, it can get really good too like i have a couple of stations that i really like that are exactly what i want to hear when i go to that station it plays nothing but music that's exactly right for that station cool all right uh, father what do you do what's what's your preference for music i've uh i've tried apple music twice i think and i still <laughs> just buy stuff uh I, I it's this this strong feeling of like well it's not really mine and maybe it's still not really mine uh <laughs> it may be deep in the uh user agreement but uh i it's just this sense of if I'm just streaming everything, I don't really have it. And I really like uh, uh, to buy a whole album. And that's just a really appealing thing to me to, to buy a whole album and to kind of like enter into that experience. Right. I really like that you can find that one song. Like, I don't like any other song by this artist, but I w- I can buy just this one is a great <laughs> thing. But uh, I, I hate how lazy it's made me and sort of superficial <laughs> about music. And so I like to I still like to get an album listen to the whole album and kind of sort of experience that way. So I still, I buy everything um, and kind of sync it with, oh, what's the Apple service? Uh, iTunes about, Match. iTunes Match, yeah. So I've yeah. been using that for several years now to have everything on my phone and my computer and everything like that. Well, there are those songs on albums that like you, you don't like the first time you hear them. But right. after you've listened to the whole album a few times, you're like, man, that's a that's a really great song. I, the, yeah. the one that's the one that always hits me is, um, you know, Joshua Tree uh, by U2 is probably iconic. I mean, it's got so many iconic U2 songs oh, yeah. on it. But my favorite song from that album um, is Red Hill Mining Town. That's like that song hits me every time uh, I listen to it. And it's not. It's not one I liked at first. It's not one that gets a lot of play anywhere else. But man, it's on that CD, and I always go to that one first when mm-hmm. I get the CD in, and then I'll listen to everything else that I know because I've heard it a million times. <laughs> Joshua Tree is the one I wore wore out the cassette tape because oh, wow. I had one of those cassette players, one of those Walkman that auto reversed, and so it yeah. would just be in there all day long playing and <laughs> there playing the out. I can't wear out my digital music, so oh, I have um, fourteen. Uh, 13,500 songs in my iTunes library. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I could listen to music for 36 days not, uh, without repeating anything. I have a lot of music. I love music. Uh, I resisted Apple Music for a long time. I, I kept saying to myself, look, here's, here's the, the value proposition. It's $120 a year. Do I buy 12 $10 albums a year? I don't. So I'm not going to do it. And then about four or five months ago, uh, as what was Apple was about to announce the streaming service. And I said, 
I have a hunch that their TV streaming service will be bundled with somehow with Apple Music, and I want to be in on that. So I'm going to get Apple Music to be ready for it. Of course, they didn't release it, it's, and we don't know what the deal is that's going to be out this fall. But I started listening to Apple Music, and it, and the, the convenience of, oh, I, I, I'm one of those people like, I, I hear like a song in my head, and I want to hear it. I want to play it. Um, and, I, and I have millions of different songs in my head. I don't know what it is. I, I'm a music person. And I can grab it any song at any time, anything, anytime I'm inspired by like something that triggers a memory. When Burt Reynolds died, I got the, the, the smoking the bandit album, you know, I mean, it just, <laughs> and that became our soundtrack for our trip to do that. We took as a family, a two week road trip. We took last year, it kind of became our soundtrack. He's bound and down. Uh, I mean, <laughs> just that ability to, to hear anything at any time was amazing to me. I still, I still have iTunes match. I still have all of that music I bought and I, I, I ripped and then I re-downloaded when the higher quality became available. I, there was a point when Apple had that, you know, Hey, whatever music you have, will when iTunes match comes out, we'll let you download the highest quality version. So like, Oh, okay. I'm, I'm in, I'm all in. I re-downloaded thousands of tracks. Uh, and now all of it's legal because some of it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's just, so I I have I'm all in on Apple Music. I, I I've tried Spotify as the free service. I got kind of a little annoyed by the ads. What got a little oppressive, you know, a little over the top because you'd be listening and all of a sudden this ad that just doesn't fit. So for like I'm listening to classical music and all of a sudden a rap album is being advertised. Mm-hmm. It just didn't fit. So I I, I, I didn't get it into Spotify. But I still sometimes buy music, certain music I want to have. And maybe I shouldn't be buying it because if I always have Apple Music, then I'll always have music. So I don't know. I feel weird about I'm old. I'm so old that I feel weird about not owning my music. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the problem. Uh, if I were if I were half my age, I'd probably be like, no, you just you 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 rent music. That's right. That, mm-hmm. That's normal. Right. So do you, uh, so I'm gonna guess that you don't have a family music account, Father Michael. Obviously, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and you you do Pandora, Thomas, right? Right, right. My my kids are, don't have devices; they don't have phones or anything. So there's no point in us having a family music account. Uh, my wife, um, she, she she just has my account in her music thing. You know, right. we, we we share the account. We don't we don't do separate. So we haven't done that. Um, I'm not looking forward to the day when I have to do it. I don't know if I will. My kids like my music, which is awesome. They they oh. love I I play music my music for them and they love it. And um, let's stay that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so that was one of my questions. So when you're in a group setting, when you're with your family or at a party, how do you listen to music? What is the what is the way you play music audibly in a room? Uh, do you have something? Do you have a, a stereo? We uh, we use Bluetooth. Uh, we take we we'll take our devices and just use Bluetooth and run it through one of those little. We have a little um, an Oont uh speaker, a Bluetooth speaker that we take around with us. So we'll charge that up, and then um, we're always listening to music in the car and just using the audio jack to plug in a, a device into the audio jack. Yeah. Uh, or or CDs. We have my my wife uh, was my wife's a librarian, former librarian, so she has uh, folders and folders and folders of all of her old CDs. Uh, mm-hmm. So the kids will go through those sometimes and go, oh, this looks interting and take it out. And we're like, OK, we can listen to that. <laughs> so <laughs> throw it in and, uh, and you know, and kind of bring back the memories from from when uh, when we were younger and, and had had all those CDs and the disposable income to buy them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but Father Michael, how do you listen to music You know, out loud, uh, say? Yeah, similarly, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, the pastor I was with as a Christmas present got me a nice Bose. Uh, speaker, Bluetooth speaker, and it's just, it's amazing what those things do now. There's, you don't need a surround sound system with something right. like that if you're not filling up a giant room. And the time I use it most is like at uh, high school youth events and different right. things like that. Because uh, I'm not bla- blasting music in the rectory with these two other priests here. <laughs> um, but uh, it's nice. Uh, in, in places like that, Bluetooth is amazing. Yeah, I we have an Amazon Echo uh, that we use, uh, have it set up in the kitchen, and that's our primary. We listen to podcasts, or uh, my wife listens, uh, she plays the uh, 
PlayStation Portable podcast with the Divine Office, and we listened, but we listen to a lot of music. And we listen to music at dinner because one of my daughters has uh, misophonia, which is the sound of people chewing essentially is <laughs> drives her insane and like she can't control it it's just so the music helps mask it like sometimes she'll shit so bad her own chewing is driving her insane oh wow so yeah so we play music to help with that which is which which it does help um and then we all dance huh. as we uh do the dishes and clean up afterward it's, <laughs> i have a that's kind of a cool idea i yeah, wish i'd I had, known that my, my brother had that my brother oh, like, yeah. growing up he was always the same way and so we, we didn't play music but that would have been that probably would have helped a lot with the problem <laughs> i think yeah it does yeah it, it uh i have lots of different playlists i have the pancake playlist that i play sunday mornings when i make pancakes uh and, and you know i have the after dinner getting ready cleaning up and getting ready for bed playlist and so i i'm, ve- I'm a very much a playlist kind of guy <laughs> uh, you it might have guessed that's um, awesome and then I have uh, an Amazon Echo Tap, which is a portable version of the Echo that you could take with us on the go. Uh, so that, that that's really good. And I have to say, for blue connecting via Bluetooth, it's awesome. Like it's so easy. I mean, it's you could just say Echo, the wake word, connect to, and then you whatever the the device name is. Like mine is iPhone DBX because it's an iPhone 10. Uh, Mel- Melanie's is iPhone MB8. I think we have it as, uh, and and it just connects. Boom, easy. So it's almost Apple like in its simplicity. So it's really nice. That's uh, cool. For in the car, uh, so in my car, I have a Honda Civic and it has Honda hands link free. So it's a Bluetooth connectivity, uh, which is kind of awesome because my old car was a cassette tape and, you know, the whole cassette adapter thing, mm-hmm. uh, which didn't work for half the time I owned it. And so I had to have a Bluetooth speaker in it that I could barely hear over the wind noise. Uh, but having it in built in is really, really great. There is that little delay, that Bluetooth delay. Uh, mm. So, so when you like, from the moment when you want to fast forward it because the controls are on the steering wheel, there's a delay and that sort of thing. So it's a little annoying, but it's it's really great. In our van that doesn't have Bluetooth, but we I got the Anchor Bluetooth Sound Sync, so it plugs into the aux jack, and that was Bluetooth, so we can connect via with our phones via Bluetooth because my phone doesn't have a headphone jack because because Apple. Because Apple. Apple. <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause> Apple. <laughs> so, uh, and I got to say, you talk about like driving in the car with the uh, the CDs. We are huge on when we're on road trips or driving, even as little as a half an hour in the car, audio books. And we've yeah. been huge on the Swallows and Amazon series of books. The kids all read them. And then we started listening to them on road on like family vacation. Now I'm hooked on them. But we can't, I can't listen to it until we're all in the car again. Yeah, together, yeah, so. yeah. that's the worst <laughs> part, isn't it? <laughs> hey, where, where, I'll tell you. Hey, you should try the Red Wall series uh, by Brian Jakes. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, with the mice. Absolutely fantastic series. I might. Ooh, that's. I might. He, yeah, because he does. He he does all the voicings. Uh, he has he has a whole acting troupe that gets together with him. Oh. And they, they do. It's a it is a production, and they are really good. I think my kids would like that too. Uh, the the series. I think that's a good. Oh, yeah. idea. I have to remember that. Um. And then um, for headphones, and I'll ask you about if you your headphone choice, if you have a particular, I have AirPods uh, that I like mm. that I I wear when I'm, especially when I'm on my daily walk. I go for a walk every morning. I like that. The no wires, the uh, constantly catching the wires and stuff. But if I'm sitting at my desk, I'm wearing my, my Audio-Technica ATH M50X headphones. These are <laughs> not cheap headphones, but I wear headphones like for six hours every day doing podcasts, but also to listen to music. Um, and they also have a creative audio SBX Kratos S5 speakers connected via USB, which is nice uh, because then I also have the headphones plugged directly into the, into the headphone jack. So I can use the controls in the Mac to switch back and forth as necessary, which is really handy for, for lots of different reasons. So how, how about you guys headphones, particular choices, anything stand out or just what came in the uh, box? <laughs> really, uh, AirPods. Since since I got AirPods, I use them constantly. They, like you said, the Apple simplicity. They just work really well. They stay in. They just yeah. ch- stay charged for a long time. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, Thomas. I I am um, being being the father of seven inquisitive kids in a super tiny house. Um, I have these highly exclusive headphones from this place called the Dollar Tree, um, <laughs> and I, I have three or three or four of them <laughs> just to make sure that I have a working set whenever I need it. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think this is a good time. We should probably uh, wrap it up here with the uh, talk about music. Uh, but this is sort of a beginning to talk about music and music technology. I'd like to talk more about. Uh, 
um, how we experience music, how we listen to music. And maybe, I, I don't know if either of you guys are musicians. Are you either of you musicians? You create music? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I am. Yeah. All right. So we will talk about the future about making music. I don't. I'm <laughs> I'm not a musician, uh, but I wish I was. I, I've always I always I've tried to play like four or five different instruments and never really got anywhere with it. But uh, I do would love to talk about making music with you guys. So this is a sort of consider this a, a first step in this journey of uh, about music uh, and technology. So uh, this was a lot of a lot of fun. So before we close out, let's. Let's do our picks of the week. I want to talk about uh, these are our uh, one thing we want to talk about today that we want to recommend to the listeners and and that we were that's uh, got our attention right now uh, this week. So, Father Michael, since uh, you haven't been with us in a long time and haven't been able to make a pick of the week, I'll let mm-hmm. you go first. Yeah. So this is tied into the the making music, and it's just a it's a cheap little piece of technology that is the best version of it that I've ever found, uh, and it's the Snark guitar and bass tuner. There's a million expensive guitar tuners, but this Snark is like this, it's it's less than $9 on Amazon, and you just clip it to the top of your guitar, and it works perfectly. And I've seen so many like professional musicians using this little junky guitar tuner. You don't need to have anything expensive. This is amazing. It's the one to buy. Awesome. Is, yeah, I always <laughs> recommend it. That That is always a good a good tip. Like when someone just says, don't ignore everything else buy this. This is the only one to get. Don't consider it. So folks, if you're looking for a guitar tuner, go get this one. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thomas? Um, I, I'm promoting uh, the VLC media player because I'm getting back into my tech lab this week and reinstalling a whole bunch of software because we uh, updated all of our computers. And this is one every single time I start a computer, this is the one I go to. It plays everything i don't care what kind of video you find i don't care what kind of music you have i don't care most obscure sound codecs and everything uh the vlc media player will handle it and if it can't handle it right away it will it, there is a plug-in for it somewhere uh it, it's great it's a free piece of software uh, it has a weird icon it's a, a traffic cone for their icon uh but it is uh it is my go-to i install it on every single machine that i touch because i i just know it works and that's that that that's when you're the tech guy you want to know the thing is going to work <laughs> yeah like uh, if you have a video file that you want to play you just throw it at vlc it'll play it no i've i've never i've never encountered a video file that it couldn't play um so yeah that vlc is is awesome um uh, you may have seen in the news recently something about a security flaw in it. Um, it turns out it was overblown that they had fixed the, the flaw months mm-hmm. ago and people hadn't noticed. But uh, so they, they, it had something to do with someone using an old version of Ubuntu with outdated libraries and stuff, that sort yeah. of stuff. So, yeah. No, it was a really highly technical thing. They fixed it. Nobody really even noticed that it was a problem until somebody did something with the older version of it right. <laughs> and said, hey, this is a problem. And, it wasn't. So. But VLC is one of those great things where it's a free, open source, cross platform, uh, user supported. You know, one of those things. It's not a big corporate thing, and it's awesome. Um, and, and I'm so happy to see it uh, still available to people. Mm-hmm. Excellent pick. Uh, my pick is an app called and and social network sort of called TV Time. Now, one of my problems is with with what we've got for all of the TV content, all the streaming video content, say, that we have today, is there's just so much of it, it's hard to keep track. Back in the day, you'd get the TV guide, and there were three channels, and you knew what you were going to watch Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, because that's what was on. Now I've got Netflix, <laughs> I've got Amazon Prime, I've got, I'm going to have Disney and Apple Plus, and all these, I don't know what I'm watching where <laughs> at any time. So what's great about TV time is, there's got it's got several things. It's supposed to be a social network to help you talk with other fans of TV shows about the sh- the shows you like. And you could do that. It's not really me. What I really like about it is it lets me uh, keep track of what I've watched so that I can go, what should I watch tonight? It's because it's, no lo- no, it's no longer appointment TV. We don't have like shows that are on, like we don't watch, I don't anyway, watch shows on a schedule, but what's available tonight or what do I have? Haven't I watched yet? So I'll, I'll pick it up and I'll look at it and go, Oh, like I've uh, I'm up to the end of season two of Vikings, and uh, oh, I could watch another uh, Agents of Shield. Oh, there's a new episode of that. I should go watch that. Um, it also will send you alerts if you let it. It say, hey, uh, just just so you know, a new episode of uh, of uh, Agents of Shield is going to be on in in an hour. So you know, get ready. 
if if you are one of those people <laughs> who watch TV live, uh, hmm, that sort of thing. Cool. So it's it's really handy. And of course, you can also do recommendations. You know, what if I like these shows, what shows will I like and that sort of stuff. But you could use as much or as little as you want. For me, it's the keeping track of <laughs> what I want to watch uh, because I'm old and I forget. So that's the hmm, uh, nice. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. And I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've I've been you know tooling around on Netflix or Amazon, going, "Oh, right, I wanted to watch that." You know, and right. I've tried yeah. like keeping lists in <laughs> Evernote and all these other ways. That, but this this one seems to be working pretty well for me. So uh, that's that's my pick, uh, and it's free, obviously. So except for your data, they take all that. So (laughs) remember, folks, you are the thing being bought and sold. (laughs) That's right. That's right. So uh, as we close out, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Jonathan K, Mark R, Ronald B, Corey L, and Jerry S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest. Uh, I, I do want to emphasize that's not i'm not just saying that's not just a line i repeat every week the fact is is uh we we making all of the shows we do cost money costs a lot of money and uh, we're not breaking even yet and we're hoping that with your help uh for listeners like you and and more as we get again new listeners uh that you can help us to reach a break-even point so that we can continue doing this we love these shows we hope you love these shows and we're looking for your help to continue to produce great content that edifies, informs, and entertains you uh, and, and other people as well. So if you can, if you have some uh, some resources, if you have uh, a, a little extra that you might be able to give, and we also have some great perks for those who do become patrons, uh, you can check all that out, sqpn.com slash give. And thank you very much. So that's it from us. What did you think of our discussion, both of why humans will never colonize Mars and uh, our experiences with music and how we enjoy music? let us know by visiting sqpn.com slash technology or our Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media, or you can send us an email to technology at sqpn.com. You can find the relevant links from our discussion, including links to our picks of the week on sqpn.com. Remember also, if you do, uh, if you can, to like Secrets of Te- each episode of Secrets of Technology on Facebook. If you, if you follow us on Twitter at sqpn, to retweet them there, leave us comments, all that. Not only does that create a sense of community and feedback that we can share during the show, we'd love to share your feedback during the show, but it also uh, gives uh, the algorithms a little juice to say, hey, people are enjoying this, and we should show it to more people. So we really appreciate that. So anyway, until next time, Thomas Sanherho, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology. Thank you very much for having me. And Father Michael Gossett, thank you as well. My pleasure, thank you. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. And now I have to go watch the season finale of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> uh-huh.